Good morning to all of you. My name is Jessica Holmes, and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. So today is day two of our uh, Green Mountain Care Board hospital budget hearing process. Just as a reminder, um, I said this on Monday, but I'll say it again today. I'll say it at the start of every uh, hearing day that we have to conduct our analysis and ultimately make a decision for each hospital. We have to look to our statute and our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Our review requires us to balance several often competing factors. For example, the need to slow the growth in healthcare expenditures while also ensuring that our hospitals have the resources they need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and provide the high quality care we expect in our communities. As we're looking to balance, you know, these competing factors of cost containment, access, quality, and health system sustainability, we have to be mindful of this year's unique circumstances uh, and the significant headwinds that we're facing. We have historically high inflation rates, workforce shortages, and the continuing impacts of COVID-19. So both nationally and in Vermont, we're seeing hospitals facing unprecedented financial challenges as our businesses, families, and individuals. So what lies before us is not easy. I think we all know that. Our short-term task is to set fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for the 14 community hospitals. And we have to do this by September 25th, I mean, September 15th, sorry. Uh, with that said, I want to remind everybody that the board is working closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work that outlined in Act 167, which aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that's going to ensure better ensure that Vermonters have access to high quality affordable care. That longer term work is going to involve extensive data analysis and community and hospital engagement to identify options for a more sustainable path forward. So as we return to the task at hand, I want to extend a thank you to each of the hospitals presenting today for the time and effort taken to submit the documents for our review. There's a few housekeeping no notes for today. Um, the presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed, so there will be a publicly available record. If any hospital's leadership believes that there's confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of the hospital's presentation or in response to board or staff questions, please alert us before responding. If needed, the Green Mountain Care Board has the ability to go into executive session to review confidential information from hospitals. I just want to note, though, that executive se sessions are limited in scope as provided by the open meeting law and they're limited to information such as contracts and information that would be considered confidential under the Public Records Act. So if an issue of possible confidentiality arises, I'll call on the board's legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in executive session, and if deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, I'll ask the board member for a motion uh, for us to go into that executive session. So knowing we have a really tight schedule today, we have three hospitals um, that we want to hear from. Uh, I'm going to hold all board and staff questions until the end of each hospital's presentation. Uh, and if Grace Cottage, if you folks could keep your keep help keep us on schedule and wrap up by 10, we would really appreciate it so we can get through all three hospitals today. So with that, Russ, I believe you are here today to help us swear in uh, Grace Cottage's witnesses. Uh, great, thank you, Chair Holmes and uh, Grace Cottage team. Uh, who from the Grace Cottage team is going to be uh, speaking today? Uh, that will be uh, both myself, uh, Doug Devello, uh, President and CEO of Grace Cottage, as well as uh, Stephen Brown, who's our uh, Chief Financial Officer. So the two of us will be speaking. Great, thank you. Uh, if you could both raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. I do. Great. Thank you. You're both sworn in. And uh, excuse me, court reporting. The gentleman that was speaking, he mentioned two names, but not his own. Oh, sorry. Douglas Develo, president and CEO. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you. I will turn it back to you, uh, Chair Holmes. Or yep. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Doug and Stephen, you are the floor is yours. Uh, if you can share your slides if you have them, that would be wonderful. 
Great, absolutely. And uh, as we put this slide uh, presentation together, we were mindful of the, the, the timing and the time frame and so forth. So we've kept it uh, fairly streamlined to try and get through this as quickly as possible. Um, 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 I think you all know that we're the smallest hospital in Vermont and probably have the simplest budget of all the hospitals in Vermont. So um, um, that being said, uh, doesn't that doesn't mean that we don't uh, find ourselves with fiscal challenges and operating challenges like most organizations. Uh, but I think we can get through this fairly efficiently. Uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. So I introduced myself. I introduced uh, my chief financial officer, Stephen. Um, and I just wanted to make some introductory comments. And I know that there's been some changes at the Green Mountain Care Board, and I don't believe uh, in the past I've I've spoken at all about you know the the history of Grace Cottage. It's quite an interesting organization, and has a, a dramatic a historical uh, story to it. And I thought I would just say a few words about that, just to kind of give you some color uh, before we start talking about numbers. Um, you know, I, uh, I asked my assistant to pull a book off the shelf uh, that was written about Grace Cottage. It's called the, Ho the House That Became a Hospital. And I thumbed through the first couple of paragraphs for just some, some talking points. And uh, I just wanted to share some of those with you. So uh, the first thing that struck me was that it was, it was in 1844, that's 178 years ago, that the building, which is now the main part of Grace Cottage Hospital, was built and it was built by uh, a local reverend by the name of Horace Fletcher. Uh, and he and his family lived there for many, many years and many generations. Um, in 1905, the very last Fletcher me family member who lived in the house uh, shared her home with a, a fairly prominent mathematics professor uh, who worked at uh, Leland and Gray Seminary. Uh, her name was Mary Plum. Um, Mary lived in the house for many, many years, and in 1938, uh, a little over 30 years after she moved into the house, uh, she uh, convinced a local physician who settled in towns and Dr. Carlos Otis and his wife to take up residence in the Fletcher family mansion. And he did so and was able to use the space not only for his own personal dwelling, but also to operate his private practice out of that uh at home as well. And uh, uh, this allowed uh, Dr. Otis um, to start on uh, his pet project of creating a, uh, a, a cottage hospital for the Southern Vermont re region and for Greater Townsend. Uh, and without that dream, you know, our organization wouldn't be here today. Uh, Dr. Otis was um, the singular driving force uh, in pulling together an entire community uh, to make this happen. Uh, one of his uh, accomplishments was that he convinced a professor uh, of UVM, a retired professor from UVM and a local physician from Newfane uh, to donate significant funds for the start of the Grace Cottage Hospital, provided that we, uh, his name was Dr. Abel Grout. And his only request was that we name the hospital after his wife. Grace and call it Grace Cottage Hospital. Um, in, in 1949, which was 72 or 3, 73 years ago, uh, a grand ceremony took place here in Townsend to celebrate the opening of uh, Grace Cottage Hospital. And the rest, as they say, is, uh, is history. So uh, it's quite, a, it's quite an, an organization over the years. Uh, buildings around the Fletcher home were acquired and used to expand the operation of the hospital. Uh, and if anybody is interested in, in touring the facility, we'd love to, 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 uh, uh, to welcome you here and we can show you some of the old buildings and how they've been uh, connected and cobbled together and how the facility kind of took growth and expansion over the many years that we've been here. Uh, we are 19 bed uh, critical access hospital uh, uh, with swing bed uh, uh, volume, as well as an emergency department. Um, this past year, um, uh, we actually this current year, we're forecasting um, a little over 3,200 visits to the emergency department. That's about 1,000 visits more than last year. Um, so things have, have been really busy uh, at the organization, uh, particularly in the ED. Um, our hospital also has uh, diagnostic imaging. We have x-ray, 
uh, CT, ultrasound, uh, bone density, um, and we also have a laboratory. Uh, our diagnostic imaging service is forecasting almost 5,500 exams for this year, which is a, a significant increase over last year. Our lab is uh, forecasting almost 65,000 laboratory visits for this fiscal year, uh, which is an increase of over 7,000 visits compared to, uh, to lab tests, rather, compared to last year uh, for the same time period. We also have uh, a very uh, uh, sophisticated inpatient and outpatient rehabilitation department uh, staffed by uh, a number of very, very uh, talented rehabilitation specialists. And uh, uh, the, we're, we're forecasting uh, a little under 53,000 uh, therapy treatments uh, for this year, uh, which is a, uh, an increase over last year of almost 1,800 uh, therapy uh, treatments. Uh, so things are really uh, are really growing uh, year over year at Grace Cottage. Um, that being said, you know our uh, probably our claim to fame is our is our primary uh, care uh, rural health clinic at Grace Cottage. Uh, that uh, uh, rural health clinic is staffed by physicians and advanced practice providers who work tirelessly to see the patients of our region and provide uh, world-class primary care. Uh, we have uh, four uh, physicians uh, staffing our primary care clinic. We have four nurse practitioners, and we have two PAs uh, staffing the clinic. Um, we, uh, we also have two behavior health providers uh, in our rural health clinic. Uh, they're both nurse practitioners. The second one was added within the last uh, month or so. So we've uh, gone from having one behavioral health provider to now having two at Grace Cottage. And that was really uh, driven by our, um, uh, our, our observation that there's just more and more need for patients to have access to behavioral health care. Um, and uh, you know, our primary care providers see those patients in their practices and having two behavioral health providers that they can call, uh, they can uh, conference with and refer patients to really helps with the, the continuity of care for the patients here in, in Townsend. Uh, on the hospital side, we have a hospitalist team uh, that consists of four physicians and a nurse practitioner, and they provide all the bedside care for, um, for our patients who are in either an acute bed or a swing bed here at Grace Cottage Hospital. And I mentioned the emergency department and the, the tremendous volume we're seeing in the ED. We have three uh, physicians uh, in the emergency department and four uh, PAs, uh, both full-time and, and per diem, uh, working shifts to keep the ED staffed 24-7 uh, here at Grace Cottage. Um, we also have um, something of a, of a unique entity here in Townsend. Uh, we have a, a pharmacy that's owned and operated by the hospital. It's called Messenger Valley Pharmacy. And that pharmacy is located right across the street from the hospital. And it's a tremendously important and convenient service for our rural health clinic patients who can walk right across the street and have their prescriptions filled within a few minutes of the provider writing the order. Um, and um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the success of that, of that pharmacy continues to astound me. Uh, we're forecasting almost, almost 54,000 scripts uh, being uh, dispensed uh, this year at Messenger Valley Pharmacy, and that's uh, almost a 1,700 uh, script increase over, over last year. So it's just amazing how uh, more and more people continue to use that, that pharmacy for their, their medication needs. And I think part of the growth there uh, was contributed by the fact that one of the community pharmacies in Brattleboro closed this past year. And we've been seeing a number of patients actually coming up from Brattleboro to fill prescriptions because of the, the, the massive challenges that the commercial pharmacies are having in Brattleboro, maintaining their staffing and providing uh, efficient uh, service to their customers. So we welcome those, those new patients to our pharmacy and uh, I think we're doing a great job of meeting their needs. Next slide, please. Catherine, you can go to the next slide, please. 
Thank you. So uh, it wouldn't be a complete presentation without us talking about our mission and vision. Um, I think it's, it's, it really speaks for itself. Our mission is to serve the healthcare needs of our community, to promote wellness, relieve suffering, and restore health. Um, I think it's really important to, to note that um, the, uh, the mission of uh, promoting wellness is really, really important for a rural health clinic. You know, we don't, we don't provide specialty care services here at the hospital. All we really do is primary care and rehabilitation. And we really believe that uh, expanding access to primary care and taking care of uh, the patients who rely on us and keeping them healthy uh, is really the key to our success in keeping patients out of the hospital and keeping them from having to avail themselves of more, of more costly healthcare services. So I really believe that uh, a well-functioning and successful primary care practice uh, over time really, really helps to um, lower healthcare costs for, for Vermont. Our, um, our vision uh, is to uh, provide personalized, competent, and accessible primary care, which I mentioned, rehab, wellness, uh, inpatient care, and emergency services. Um, we uh, collaborate with uh, other community agencies, and our goal is to make sure that anything we can do for the wellness of our community is, uh, is an opportunity that we, um, we jump on. And uh, you know, we really believe in taking care of the entire person as part of our, our vision. And um, we also focus very uh, closely on the culture of the region and make sure that everything we do uh, is focused on making sure that we're meeting uh, the needs uh, of our culture and our diversity here in Southern Vermont. Uh, I'd like to turn the, uh, the microphone now over to Stephen Brown, who will uh, start uh, with the uh, net patient revenue portion of the presentation and the summary of our budget request. Stephen? Yes, thank you. Um, quite simply, 2022 thus far has been a very busy year, as Doug alluded to in a couple of his comments, um, particularly in the emergency department, but throughout the entire facility, um, inpatient census, primary care, all of the related outpatient services that come as a result of that diagnostic imaging lab, outpatient rehab, are all above budget for the current fiscal year. And our gross patient revenue and net patient revenue Projection and budget for next year is based entirely on that volume. We have no reason to believe that our current volume of business throughout the facility will not continue at the same rate that it is. Um, all volumes for the coming year are based on what we have done thus far the first seven months at the time we were preparing this budget. And those have continued in May, June, uh, and July since that time. In all areas, the only slight variations from that is within the provider clinic, our primary care clinic, and the mental health clinic, we have additional volume in those for the providers that have either come on partway through this year, such as the the second psychiatric nurse practitioner that just started, as well as the three, two new primary care MDs we have arriving in um, October. And correspondingly in the retail pharmacy, a slight increase in number of prescriptions being filled for both those providers, but more so for the increase in volume we've seen over there, the last couple of months in that time period that we were looking at when a local retail pharmacy in Brattleboro closed and the extensive issues that the major retail chains in our area have been having both in Brattleboro, Wilmington and Manchester. In fact, we've been seeing a lot of patients coming to our retail pharmacy as a result of those um, 
major chains, you might have seen the article that was in the newspaper recently about complaints being filed with the pharmacy board about those chains closing their doors unannounced for days at a time and patients not being able to get their prescriptions. So that accounts for where our numbers come from. Um, again, no major, no changes really. Um, not expecting any huge increases in volume from where we're at. Our requested rate increase is a 5% to charges across the board. Um, that while that doesn't really keep up with anywhere near inflation across the board, nor as you're well aware, do we begin to collect even part of that 5% increase in the bottom line, um, it's the minimum that we feel is necessary to try to meet the continued increases in operating expenses that we are experiencing. The next slide, Catherine, which has the income statement, which you all have, this is your form, um, summarizes all of that. And as a, you can see, our 22 budget was pretty much the same numbers as where our 2021 actual ended up. However, our projection is significantly greater than that due to beyond our control. We are just taking care of all of the patients that are walking in our door and short of not taking care of those patients, we have no control over the fact that that volume is increasing. And again, I expect that it will continue. Next slide, balance sheet. And as a result of that, you can see that our balance sheet has continued from 2020 through now and the projection be one of the most positive balance sheets, actually the most positive balance sheets I have seen in my almost 40 years here. The Previous 2020 and 2021 has into 20 early 22 had a lot of funds in there. You know, you'll see the large in fluctuations in cash balance as well as liabilities as a result of all of the COVID funds we received, both in the stimulus act funds as well as the Medicare advanced payment funds, which we are currently in the process of paying back and will all have be paid back at the very beginning of fiscal year 23. Um, all of that cash is still sitting in our account and will be paid back soon. Um, next page cash flow just gives you a quick snapshot of that and you can see um, the corresponding cash balance and that decrease is strictly either returning our unused CARES Act funds. We returned about $1.8 million earlier this fiscal year of funds that we did not need, as well as the fact that we have been for the past year and a half returning the Medicare Advance funds. Next slide, I already talked about the change in charge and the 5% that we requested overall. So I don't see any more to add to that. Next slide on other operating and non-operating. Our two primary amounts in the other operating revenue line are the 340B retail pharmacy program, which nets about $730,000 in the current fiscal year and is budgeted just under $800,000 for fiscal year 23. Um, primarily the retail pharmacy program is strictly related to filling prescriptions at our retail pharmacy for the patients we take care of. The second part is the retail pharmacy overall gain or loss, which unfortunately in the current reimbursement scheme of retail pharmacies will probably always be a loss going forward. It's roughly a $200,000 loss for the current fiscal year. And due to that, 
continued increase in prescriptions being filled, roughly $128,000 loss next year. Non-operating revenue for us is all um, a result of our <clears throat> very supportive community committed to assuring our continued excellence and the excellent work of our foundation, the Grace Cottage Foundation, and all of their efforts to um, keep in contact with those donors. And we are happy to know that those donors are always there for us when we need them. Whenever there's a need, they're there for us. And has has been what has kept this organization in business throughout its entire history and definitely the 38 years that I have been here. Uh, next slide on operating expenses. Our, I'm sure what I'm, you see on here and what I'm going to tell you is no different than anything you've heard from the hospitals you heard from on Monday and we'll hear from the rest of the hearings. Travelers is by far the biggest expense variation um, for us. It was a million dollars over what we budgeted in the first nine months of the current fiscal year, um, both due to need, um, continuing in our case to have five nurse travelers in the building pretty much all year where our average Sometimes we get up to two, sometimes three. Um, never do we get up to five and stay at five for an entire year. But more importantly, the dramatic increase in cost of getting those from rates around $65 an hour, even a year and a half ago, to $200 an hour for that same position. Fortunately, that has slowly started trending back down a little bit over the last couple of months, as well as we are filling positions with the goal that we are hopefully going to decrease that number down to, if not zero, close to zero within the next few months. Um, having done that by market adjustments um, to both retain staff and recruit staff. Um, hopefully it will work and we can dramatically increase that overage. Um, but right now it's it's a cost of doing business in healthcare. As you're well aware, um, inflation across the board is beyond anything I have ever seen. Some areas are 10, 20, 30 percent above where they were. The cost of supplies particularly are just way up um, if you can get them and continue to have all kinds of charges add. I mean, almost every invoice I get now has a fuel surcharge on it. Um, there's just continued inflationary um, constraints. All of that said, next slide, Catherine, our overall operating margin and total margin. Um, well, the char charge increase is not adequate to produce an overall operating margin. The total margin is a minimum, minimal excess as a result of our strong community support. Um, we would very much like to have requested 10% or even higher in hopes of getting a positive operating margin, but are doing our best to keep costs in line. Um, and again, relying on that strong community support and non-operating revenue. And at that point, this point, I will turn it back over to Doug to talk about the equity question. Um. Thank you, Stephen. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it's important on, on the non-operating revenue side uh, to to highlight the fact that the the stock market has not done very well, uh, uh, as well, <laughs> and uh, and that's had uh, you know dramatic impact on our non-operating income as it relates to our 
our foundation and our investments. So uh, a lot of things stacked against us, and hopefully uh, we will uh, see a return to some normalcy in the coming year or two or three. Um, I know this, the, the question of equity is an important one, and, and it's been asked in, in prior years as well, and, and rightly so. Um, in 2019, we made the strategic decision to create an equity committee uh, and to make uh, this, uh, this work of, of, of looking at equity uh, as an organization a, uh, a major strategic plan for Grace Cottage. Uh, that committee was formed through a collaboration of uh, hospital employees with specific interest in this topic as well as active members uh, of the community and folks uh, from the region who, um, uh, who represent uh, uh, the LGBTQ plus community. And this team of individuals, I think did an amazing job and did some really significant work for Grace Cottage and highlighting the culture here. Um, you know, we really believe that every patient who comes to Grace Cottage, regardless of their um, of their beliefs, um, regardless of their uh, culture, uh, despite their diversity, uh, be treated the same and be treated like everyone else. And that's something that we believe in. It's something that we we demonstrate every single day. And uh, the equity committee really helped us to highlight that piece of our of our uh, important culture here. And um, uh, they uh, set a goal to. Um, achieve recognition by the, uh, the human rights campaign uh, and getting Grace Cottage listed on uh, their health uh, equity index as a leading organization in the state of Vermont. And um, we went through that process. We went through the, the uh, self-assessment and then ultimately we were surveyed by the human rights campaign as part of that um, nomination process. I'm really pleased to say Grace Cottage scored uh, a 95 out of a 100 possible points uh, on the Health Equity Index, uh, which was the highest score achieved by any hospital and, and matched by only one hospital in the state of Vermont. Um, and uh, uh, as a result of that, we are now proudly listed on the Health Equity uh, Index, uh, Health Equality Index as an organization who people can go to with confidence, knowing that their unique uh, beliefs and their their unique unique uh, diversity will be celebrated, and will they will get the, the very best care possible uh, when they come to Grace Cottage. We've taken that work and we've done extensive education for uh, members of our team, our staff, our our leadership, uh, and our medical staff as well, and. Uh, uh, we continue uh, that strategic initiative going into 2023 as well. Uh, we're going to do another self-assessment uh, in the next month or so uh, to make sure that those goals and objectives that kept us from scoring a 100 versus 95 uh, become part of our uh, work plan and focus so that we can be the very best we can uh, as an organization that celebrates equity and equality. Any questions there? Uh, if not, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, another important topic that you wanted us to talk about uh, is the, the issue of wait times. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, Grace Cottage you know, is, a, is a primary care facility, primary care organization with behavioral health embedded in our practice. We do not uh, provide specialty services here at Grace Cottage. So, um, that kind of makes us a little unique when talking about wait times. Um, but I can speak to wait times for primary care, and we're actually quite proud of, uh, of our success in this area. Uh, we have a team of central schedulers here at Grace Cottage who do nothing but take referrals and answer the phone uh, uh, from patients who call to make appointments for primary care. And they have access to all of the provider schedules and they have permission to schedule patients with any provider who has an open slot uh, in their schedule. So at the time that a request for an appointment is asked, asked for, um, the majority of the time that appointment is given with, with no wait time uh, incurring as a result of that. Um, if the patient needs a, a follow-up appointment after a visit to one of our providers, uh, we have designated slots that are held in their schedules for 
uh, weeks after the day of the initial appointment. So a follow-up appointment is given to patients uh, at the time that they finish their initial appointment with their provider. So uh, we're very successful in getting patients in to see their, uh, their doctor or their advanced practice provider and to get the, the appointments that they really need. Uh, we also have a designated specialty uh, clinic with a separate schedule for those patients who have acute care or respiratory symptoms that need to be seen immediately. And we also have a triage nurse who um, works with our scheduling team to talk with these patients when they call. So if a patient calls and says, you know, I'm not feeling well, here, these are my symptoms. Um, I really want to be seen. I think I need to be seen right away. Uh, that triage nurse can look at the schedule, can, can put that patient on the schedule the same day as the phone call if there's an available slot, if there's a late cancellation or no-show, uh, or if the triage nurse feels that the patient needs a higher level of care than just seeing a provider in the clinic, uh, that uh, nurse can make arrangements for the patient to be seen in the emergency department, and we coordinate that visit with the folks in the ED. Uh, and as Stephen mentioned, we've been really successful in recruiting primary care providers. Uh, and while all organizations uh, do see change and, and people come and go, we've had some providers leave Grace Cottage, but we've been successful in recruiting replacement providers uh, in excess of those that we've lost. So the net result is that we continue to slowly grow the number of physicians, uh, PAs, and NPs who are here on our staff to see patients and will continue to stay ahead of the curve to make sure that we can handle that steady growth that we're seeing year over year so that access is, uh, is uh, successful and that wait times are minimized. Any questions about wait times? Um, I think it's important as we go to the next slide, uh, uh, risks and opportunities, uh, one of the thing, one of the bullets I've mentioned here is delays in ED patient transfer due to delivery stress, system stress. Uh, I think you're going to hear from hospitals how difficult it is for them to get patients uh, into their organizations that need specialty care, particularly from organizations that, uh, that like Grace Cottage, who don't have specialty services here on site and need to transfer patients, whether it's for cardiology, whether it's for pulmonology whether it's you know, uh, um, uh, cancer care um, uh, or just a general trauma surgery, a, a trauma surgery, for example. Um, many times we, we see patients in our ED that require a transfer to a higher level of care that can wait uh, significantly longer than we would like them to wait here at Grace Cottage for that transfer to occur. And oftentimes we have to call multiple organizations um, to uh, locate uh, a transfer opportunity for a patient that's in our emergency department. And you know, that's a real problem. I think it's a problem for all hospitals. And I think it's a system issue that, that we as a state need to figure out how to address. And I'm really glad that the Green Mountain Care Board is, uh, is focusing on wait times. Uh, we've got to figure this out. We've got to make sure that we've got the specialists statewide that can meet the needs of the patients uh, uh, in a timely fashion. Uh, another risk, uh, and I think as Stephen mentioned in his comment, you know, reimbursement. Reimbursement is a real challenge at Grace Cottage. Uh, fortunately, you know, the med number of Medicaid patients we see here uh, is not overwhelming by any means, but it certainly creates a fiscal challenge for Grace Cottage in that, you know, we receive, uh, you know, less than 50 cents on the dollar uh, of our costs for taking care of Medicaid patients. Uh, we also don't recover anywhere near our costs for Medicare patients as well. Um, and that's a real risk for a hospital like Grace Cottage that does primary care. And we've got to figure out uh, how, to, um, uh, how to push the, the, the lever of reimbursement reform uh, so that we can just get a little bit more uh, of our costs for taking care of Medicare and Medicaid patients. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, primary care is so important to keeping healthcare costs low, lower, lowering healthcare costs are going to require us to keep people healthier and out of the hospital. Um, and we need the funds to do that. Uh, if Grace Cottage closes because of its inability to function financially uh, in a healthy way, uh, that's going to impede our ability to keep people, you know, um, out of the emergency room 
and uh, and to keep costs uh, lower than they than they need be. Um, and then the staffing costs, the nurse traveler issue, we talked about that. This year has been a real challenge. I'm hopeful that uh, a supply and demand um, uh, you know, shift will occur in the next year and that rates for travelers and agency staff will return to what used to be uh, the normal uh, expenses that we uh, have budgeted in the past. Um, we're doing everything we can to recruit uh, nurses who want to work here full time rather than coming here as an agency staff member. Uh, we lost a couple of uh, two, three nurses who left Grace Cottage to go work for travel agencies when they saw how much money could be made. Uh, two of those three nurses are now back at Grace Cottage uh, working for us again. Um, and uh, I think that's a testament to the great place this is and why people really want to work at Grace Cottage and why our turnover rates for staff are, are really world-class. Uh, people wanna work here and people will generally stay when they come to work at Grace Cottage. On the opportunity side, um, uh, I mentioned uh, the addition of primary care providers in 2020, fiscal 2023. Um, we've got uh, two really uh, stellar physicians who will be joining us in October. And we also have a nurse practitioner who's joining us in September. Um, they, uh, one of those physicians is a, a local new grad from UVM. Uh, I was talking to one of the professors at UVM who said to me that they tried to do everything possible to keep this young man from leaving UVM. Uh, they wanted him to stay, uh, but he chose to come and practice rural medicine here in Townsend, Vermont, as part of the Grace Cottage team. So we're really happy about that. The other physician is a practitioner in Brattleboro who has a mature practice and will be coming here and probably bringing a good portion of his practice with him to Grace Cottage as new patients. Um, so we're, we're doing well on the, on the staffing side, uh, despite the challenges that other hospitals seem to be having in uh, attracting primary care uh, uh, members to their teams. Uh, we're, we're really having a, a, a good run of success. And then the last um, opportunity bullet I have here is the design and construction of a new clinic building. Um, you'll be hearing about this project in the coming months. Uh, uh, ultimately, we'll be submitting a, a certificate of need request to the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, where we'll be uh, talking to you about our plans for a building uh, that will be uh, new to our campus that will consolidate the current clinic uh, work that's being done uh, in a um, uh, in a disassociated uh, fashion. We currently have three distinct clinic locations with three registration points uh, and patients depending on the provider they're seeing have to go to the registration point that corresponds to that provider's practice and so uh, obviously that's not the most efficient way of, of running a rural health clinic it duplicates staff it duplicates registration uh, to some extent duplicates nursing support and so forth so we really want to create a building uh, that can allow us to run the clinic in one location to uh, take advantage of economies of scale, take advantage of, a, of a operating efficiencies, and ultimately provide care to our patients at a lower cost. And so that's our dream. Uh, in the next two to three years, we hope to have that building become a reality. And we look forward to talking with you uh, later as we uh, coalesce our application and uh, our formal submission for that new building. Um, if there are no questions, I know you, uh, I know uh, Jessica, you want questions at the end, so I'm not going to ask for questions. I'm just going to turn the mic back to Stephen, who is going to talk about our capital plans for fiscal 2023. All right, included in the budget um, capital section for capital plans are not any particularly large projects for fiscal year 23. I outlined a couple of them here. <coughs> Excuse me. The biggest one is probably replacement of our diagnostic x-ray room, the table and all of that stuff. Um, the one we have is getting is end of life and time to be replaced. We have a few small IT projects, nothing large. We've done most of our large IT projects over the last two or three years. 
including replacing all of our servers and wireless infrastructure and are in amidst replacing our phone system this fiscal year. And then some boring things like resurfacing the hospital parking lot. Um, as Doug just mentioned, our biggest upcoming project in probably 24, but most likely 25, will be um, replacing or building a new primary care and mental health provider clinic building. Um, currently in the fiscal year we're in, we are, um, as I mentioned, upgrading our or replacing our phone system completely. Um, we are also working on a small project to expand our e not expand our ed um expand the space not expand the number of ed beds but um to improve security provide better patient privacy improved increase efficiency essentially making a more formal entrance for the emergency department with a, a secure formal entrance with the emergency department with a place for the security guard to sit and registration clerk instead of coming currently our front door if you haven't been down here but for both the emergency department and the hospital walk right into the same space and essentially um patients being registered for the emergency department are sitting in the hallway outside of the emergency department room so we're excited about that project and um that's pretty much it for capital plans. So at that point, I will turn it back to Jessica, I see, I guess, and continue on with the process. Great. Well, thank you very, very much. I appreciate uh, We're definitely on time today, so I appreciate that. Um, I will open it up to questions from the board. And again, I'm starting with Robin. Great. Thank you. Um, Thanks so much for your presentation. It's nice to see you. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, first of all, uh, I just wanted to say it's great to hear about your work um, to move away from travelers and that you're hoping to reduce those uh, number of contracts due to the, the expense um, the expense pressures that you mentioned. So I just wanted to applaud you for that. I did have a couple of questions um, about some of the details related to that budget item. Can you speak in a little more detail to how you budgeted travelers for fiscal year 23? We budgeted, um, the way we normally budget is to have two people in the building. Um, and that generally in the past has always been more than enough. And the way I actually budget them is the presumption that all of our positions will be filled. So if I've got two vacant RM positions, the actual positions are budgeted in salary and benefits. And then what I budget on the actual travel line is the premium above and beyond what the cost of those people would be if they were here full time. Great. And so did you... in? That makes sense. Um, and that makes sense to go back to the two that you typically do. Mm -hmm. In terms of the traveler rates, um, can you speak to how you estimated that? I know that's going to be tough this year. I, I believe the, I would have to pull out it out, but I think it was around, um, like I said, we have be, had been up almost to $200 an hour. I think I budgeted around um, one. 20 or 30 because it was on it it had just started going back down in may when we were working on the budget um and i believe um our cno said the other day the last one she did was around 130 i think great thank you um and could you also give a little more color commentary in terms of the the wage increases and retention efforts that you've done in fiscal year 22 to keep folks and how um, you're anticipating that flowing into the 23 budget. 
We we always force wages around here or in the facility look regularly at we participate along with most all other Vermont hospitals in an annual South wage survey done by the Vermont, New Hampshire and Maine hospital associations. And we always when we're hiring look at those salary surveys um, to keep in line with market and try to keep somewhat reasonably close to those. Um, above and beyond that, for the current year, however, we, particularly in nursing, did a department-wide market adjustment to try and remain competitive within for both the surrounding facilities, but nursing rates in general in this area. Um, so that was a significant change for the whole nursing department. We've also had to do similar things with housekeeping, food service staff. We actually just increased our minimum wage from 15 to $17 an hour um, in, within the past month for the whole facility, which didn't affect a lot of people, but it was mostly most of the housekeeping and food service staff primarily. Um, so, in most cases, particularly the nursing rates are all included, that increase is all included in next year's budget. The increase from 15 to 17 is not, that's not going to be a huge additional expense, but because um, that was just done in the past month. Um, but it's just a matter of trying to, you know, keep people from thinking, oh, I can earn a dollar an hour more by driving 20 miles down the road. And <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough environment. It, it uh, certainly is. It's definitely by far the toughest I have seen in all my years here. Yeah. And it looked like in the, um, the material that we received, the budget submission materials that you were estimating like about a 5% wage increase in 23. Overall, across the board, yes. Right. Um, so one of the questions I'm going to ask all of the critical access hospitals is to speak a little bit to uh, the higher fiscal year 22 expenses that you've experienced and how those, how you would expect those to flow into your Medicare cost reports and then hit Medicare reimbursement and when you would expect that cost settlement process to be completed? The cost report is required to be submitted by the end of February for the current fiscal year. So the September 30th, 21 cost report is submitted by February 28th. And then they generally, um, Medicare generally processes though has to is supposed to process those within 60 days and usually takes the full 60 days so sometime around the end of april you will see the interim rate adjustment and any settlement coming back one way or the other um, it flow the costs flow very differently depending upon which departments it's in um, fortunately for us, the, one of the biggest of variances, as you're well aware, is the traveler cost. Um, yeah. And that is in, of course, the acute and swing bed area. And that has our highest Medicare percentage. I'm not sure off the top of my head at the moment what it is. It's probably still around 85%. Uh, Medicare patients. So fortunately, they pay a significant portion of that. Um, it may be dropping. It actually may be less than that now because so many people are switching to Medicare replacement plans and those don't actually count as Medicare patients. They count as commercial. So right. even though we've still got those same patients, they're being paid differently. Um, most of the rest, on average for our facility, Medicare is roughly 60 some odd percent of our overall business. Um, that being said, we are in the, um, an unusual situation this year where because our inpatient census is so high that we probably are not going to expect a huge cost report reimbursement when we submit because we've got more patient days. So our cost per patient day is 
being divided by a no larger number of patients. So most likely we are not see, going to see a, most of the, any of that money come back. I'm just hopeful actually that we don't owe Medicare money this year because of the fact that we've had those additional patient days and been getting paid for those throughout the year. It's a very complicated system, this cost report. Yes, it is, uh, which is why I appreciate you walking us through it and having a better understanding of what your expectation is around that reimbursement. Um, and then lastly, could you speak a little bit to any cost savings efforts or expense reduction efforts that uh, you're going to embrace either currently or expect to uh, pursue in 2023? Truthfully, we do not have any significant or potential cost saving efforts. I mean, we have always done all we can do to reduce costs. I mean, we continue to look for ways in areas such as, um, you know, energy efficiency, things like that. We actually intended in July of last year to undertake three, on that particular note, install three different um, HVAC upgrades, mini split systems in three different buildings paid the deposit for all three of them and thus far have only had one building completed and are currently looking for a provider to do the other two buildings because there's not enough people to do the work. You can't get it done. Um, in fact, the large company that we use for all of our other work, we finally asked them to come and give us a quote about three weeks ago and they're coming, I believe, the third week of September to even look at what we want to have done. So, you know, it's... <laughs> We're trying, you just can't get it done. Um, yeah. But it, for general expenses, no. I mean, we we run a very tight ship, if you will, when it comes to operating expenses. And all of our department heads are very good at looking at every line item on their reports. And we provide each department with detailed line items every month of their both revenue, if there are revenue producing department, as well as expense lines. And Doug and I meet with every department head every month and review those variances. Um, and they're all very conscious of not spending any money they don't need to spend. Thank you. Uh, I'll back to you, Jess. Those are my questions. Thanks very much. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Tom Pelham, board member Pelham, please. Well, good morning. It's nice to see you uh, again. Um, I remember, remember my days in the Leland and Gray gym <laughs> and down on the soccer field that had a class four road that ran through it. Um, it's still there. It's mm -hmm. still there. So um, <clears throat> I'll try not to be too redundant here. Um, uh, you know, it's it's in looking at Grace Cottage's budget, it's kind of interesting because there's some big percentages, but very small dollar amounts. So like exactly. the entire budget to budget increase is three point three million dollars. Um, so, you know, when you start to break, try to break that down, there, it can be get pretty noisy, I think. But I was looking at um, your payer mix table and where you were looking for the growth uh, to fund the 15 percent overall increase was a 24%, and this is budget to budget, I'm sorry about that, um, but as a 24% increase in Medicaid revenue and a 30% increase in commercial revenue. And uh, if I were to guess what your answer would be as to what's driving that, it would be we are um, uh, projecting off of our projections through July, I guess, or, or, or um, so um, if that is your answer, what what do you think the risk is that you won't hit a 24 percent increase or a 30 percent increase, 24 percent increase in Medicaid and a 30 percent increase in um, uh, commercial? You're right. Those are um, looking at budget to budget. That is correct. But it is based out what I budgeted next year is based on where we're currently at. So the increase from projection is not that. <clears throat> and what's really accounted for that is um, the increase in Medicaid particularly, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll see has continued over the last three years as people have lost jobs and normally in the 
previous year or two, the commercial has either stayed relatively flat or gone down as Medicaid has increased. But what's accounting for a lot of that this year is, as you heard me just mention, a lot of our patients, um, Medicare patients are now choosing Medicare replacement plans, which are considered commercial insurance. Um, both we're seeing significantly more of those, but also what's yeah. skewing our numbers somewhat, and you'll see a decrease in Medicare, is that prior to the current fiscal year, those commercial plans for the people we had were still included in Medicare revenue. Our, our billing system didn't have a separate financial class, so those Medicare replacement plans were part of Medicare revenue. They have, I think, I think she started it earlier this fiscal year, set up a separate financial class, so they're now being counted as commercial as they should be. So that's part of the reason why the commercial looks like it's going up and Medicare is going down. Well, thank you for that. Um, somewhat related to that, I was looking at your utilization table. And uh, in terms of acute bed use uh, increasing from 285 patient days uh, in the fiscal 22 budget to 393, and uh, for the um, observation patient days increasing 60% from 81 days to 130. And so I, I, uh, I can accept that that's kind of what the track record is uh, through fiscal 2022, and this is off of projections. Right. But, but behind it, what, what do you think the dynamic is, you know, that's, that's driving that increased utilization? Two things. Primarily what has driven it up until the time that I did those projections. Um, as Doug alluded to, you'll, if you look, you'll also see that the emergency department is way ahead of volume, like up 35 or 40 percent. Again, small numbers, not that that's a huge number of people around here. I have an average of eight a day to now nine point something a day. But um, more, most of our acute patients come through the emergency department. And so there's more patients here to be admitted. Um, the other thing that is going to allow us to continue to keep whether it's acute or observation patients, is we have implemented over the past few months um, tele-services with Dartmouth, two different contracts, one for tele-psychiatry um, and tele-stroke, so that we are able to get help assessing some of those patients, and in some cases, keep those patients here that would have been transferred someplace else to be assessed and then of course ended up staying there. But most of that change in volume is simply the fact that the ER has been so busy. And I think a little bit, you know, maybe, um, you know, nobody really knows why the emergency department has been staying busy. One possibility, a few of those patients might be the fact that the local urgent care center has been closed as much as it's been open due to staffing just like everybody else. So we get a few patients from there, um, but, or people are just traveling and more people in the area, it's hard to say. So if that urgent care um, facility started to get fully staffed, that that might be a risk. Uh, if that's where they're coming from, truthfully, I don't think a lot of yeah. them is. I think, I mean, they are, because I think most likely if, if you wanted to go there, you'd probably go to BMH's ER. Um, being as it's in Brattleboro, the urgent care facility. Um, but, you know, I think it's just a combination of, yep. of things. So looking at, I was looking at your pr provider tax number, which is a 29%, 30% uh, increase budget to budget. And uh, I just, you know, the methodology that hospitals use, I know varies um, across hospitals. But I took 6% of your 22 projected NPR FPP, and that came to $1.4 million, uh, which is, uh, and I think what you budgeted uh, is $951 million. So I, I'm just wondering what your calculation approach is that you used um, for uh, the provider tax. Um, because provider tax is not calculated on swing bed revenue. And that, if you look, swing bed is 
a significant portion of our um, inpatient revenue. So for instance, in 23, our swing bed revenue is about up the gross 7.7 .7 million of $40 million gross. So that mm -hmm. comes out from there. Thank you for that. And I think lastly, um, so I was <clears throat> uh, looking at your trends in terms of non-operating revenue. And I recall from our previous discussions that had a lot to do with the generosity of uh, of your community and your your fundraising effort and um, looking back at the trend in terms of non-operating from 2021 actual to 2023 budget um, it, it was trending down um, at about 11 percent a year um, and I'm just wondering if um, uh, you know you I think you said during your narrative or during your presentation that you know, you you have folks out in the community that you can call when you need them. And so um, is the number then that you have, which is a higher number um, in the 2023 budget, is that assuming, what is that assuming about, you know, the 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 uh, the, the folks that are on your, your on, on your um, contribution list? Um, I mean, I, I guess okay. I'm getting okay. trying to get a sense. Is do you I, feel I see where you're going. Um, for what, what might make it a little easier to understand or make a little more sense is that the non operating revenue also includes, um, as Doug mentioned, market the market change, right. market value change of investments is, of course, on that line. Um, and I don't generally budget the number budget number going forward doesn't gen usually include that because who knows if it's going up or down. I usually budget just the actual contributions. The 23 contribution amount is the same as the 22 projection okay. amount. So what the difference is, is the current projection amount includes huge negative market value changes that with any luck will be going back up. But you know, well, at this point, who knows if it will between now and the end of September. But the actual well, contributions are higher. Well, that makes sense to me. Uh, thank okay. you for that. Um, and for me, I think that's it. So I will pass it back to Jess. Great. Well, that just allows me to pass it back to Tom Walsh. Thank you, Jess. And uh, good morning, Doug. It's nice to see you again. And it's nice mm -hmm. to meet you, Stephen. Um, I first wanted to just commend you on the, the work your organization has done with equity. Um, the achievement that you've made there is outstanding. Um, similarly, the, your wait times are remarkably good. It looks like um, a success story from IHI. And I wonder if, um, if you can recall a time when you had longer wait times and if you would describe for us the effort that it took to get to where you're at. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question. Um, you know, I've been at Grace Cottage now uh, going on four and a half years, and um, you know, I I remember um, you know talking with my team when we when we you know began to look at you know how to make sure we uh, we develop a strategic plan that's going to allow us to be successful in the years to come. And um, you know, one of the things we talked about as a group is you know. How do we focus on and monitor access to our providers? Because I truly believed at the time that the key to our success, aside from the fact that we have really, really great people who treat people, you know, with with their hearts, um, and uh, you know, uh, and we have wonderful community uh, reputation, uh, it was really all about uh, being able to give patients appointments when they want them. I mean, it's as simple as that. It's simple business. Uh, people who don't feel well are going to seek care wherever they can get it and wherever they can get it quickly. And so, you know, as a team, we said, you know, we've got to stay ahead of the curve. We cannot wait until providers leave the organization and leave us with a, a hole uh, to fill and then start trying to recruit someone to replace that that hole and uh, and to rebuild that capacity. Because as you know, uh, it could take upwards of a year 
between the time you start recruiting a provider to the time you sign them, to the time they give notice, to the time you get them credentialed with insurance carriers. Um, it takes a long time to, uh, to, 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 to replace an outgoing provider, physician or otherwise. So, you know, we, we really um, uh, work diligently to focus on uh, what our providers need, what their future plans are. Uh, we've had some people leave, but they, it wasn't a surprise to us because we had had conversations with them for many, many months about their plans and what they want to do and where they're going to go. And, and so to the extent that you can, uh, you know, have advanced notice about when an opportunity might develop that you can begin recruiting for early uh, rather than later, uh, it allows you to maintain your ability to, uh, to provide that capacity and to give people uh, appointments. Uh, and, and so that's really been a focus of ours, to making sure that we don't fall you know, behind the market with regard to access, of making sure we stay ahead of the curve. So uh, come October, we are going to have uh, capacity at Grace Cottage that will need to be filled. Um, uh, and, and we believe that when you, you, know, you, you build it, they will come. If you create capacity and then promote the fact that you have you know, immediate appointments available and you're accepting new patients, uh, just give us a call, uh, patients will call. And we know there are a lot of patients in the community uh, who are looking for uh, uh, providers uh, that want to establish uh, with a practice and cannot find anyone who's taking new patients. Um, we have a few uh, providers at Grace Cottage who are still taking new patients, which is good. And we're building uh, on that capacity with our new hires uh, later this year. So really it's, it's about planning. It's about staying ahead of the curve. It's about watching the horizon and uh, and being prepared. Uh, and then finally, I just want to say that um, um, you know, when I when I when I took this position four and a half years ago, folks you know warned me that wow, it's going to be difficult hiring people to come and work in Townsend, Vermont. Um, and yeah, Townsend you know has its challenges. We've got housing challenges. We've got you know uh, there's not a lot of retail locally people have to travel for groceries and other retail needs and so forth but what we lack in uh, in, in everyday uh, uh, comforts we, we make up for in other really spectacular ways and uh, you know we focus and we promote the, the the good and the positives of of having a practice and a work life in southern Vermont and all that comes with it and we believe that we have a great thing to offer here, and that's helped us recruit people who have been looking for just a change in their in their lifestyle. You know, I received a call from a provider yesterday who uh, left uh, to go to uh, Burlington, Vermont, uh, for a job opportunity, and uh, has been there a little less than a year. And he called and said, "You know, Doug, uh, I'm thinking about coming back to to Southern Vermont, to Townsend. And I miss it. I miss the lifestyle." Um, I miss the quality of life. And uh, if you have any opportunities or any openings, uh, you know, that you, you may need somebody, keep me in mind. I'd love to come back. So uh, it's just, I think, one, just one of many examples of where we've been successful in attracting people to come work here where other organizations have been having difficulty. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'd also, I'd, I'd like to try to explore the increased utilization of the emergency department a little bit. And um, Stephen, you'd mentioned earlier that it may be closure of the urgent care, but that's unlikely because there's another opportunity, there's another place pretty close to that. But um, have you uh, started or considered starting efforts to try to understand the needs of those, those patients? Oftentimes, um, a few different projects I've worked on in different places. Increased volume in the emergency department is not a, a huge increase in unique individuals. It's uh, yeah. return, re repeat visits. And yeah, I think that's a great. A few. And so understanding the needs of those patients and, and um, bringing the care they need in order to not need emergent or urgent care. Um, it, can often end up being a, a savings to the system, right? So can you talk a little bit about uh, where your thinking's at with um, exploring the emergency department utilization? We yeah, can Tom. certainly look at that. I mean, I, 
I'm not aware that we have a big issue with repeat customers in our emergency department. Um, we can certainly talk to our ED director about that. Um, the other thing I didn't mention, which I think has been accounting for um, some of the volume increase here is particularly in this area, pretty much every second home of which there are lots and lots of them in this area is currently fully occupied um, by people who either have decided to move here full time into their second homes or have been living here full time in their second homes for the last couple of years, more or less, and likely have not necessarily decided to change their primary care here. So when they need to have something done, of course, they're ending up in the ER. Um, we do know that that's what some of the patients have been. Um, but, you know, again, with a small number of volume, we certainly could look at those patients and look at them. You know, it's still, as I said, only an average of nine some people a day. So um, I think one of the other factors that, that that's hard, hard to uh, 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 to validate is the fact that um, in the last uh, two to three years, um, we we have um, essentially replaced all of our emergency room providers with new providers, um, and the providers we have now working in our emergency room are our local uh, individuals who uh, have have been working in Vermont for a good portion of their of their careers, and um, are now working at Grace Cottage, and they have reputations, they're well known. Um, and I think people are very comfortable coming here knowing that uh, they know who they're going to see and they know they're going to get good care. Uh, and I believe that our reputation for providing quick and timely access to care in the ED also helps our costs. You know, you come to the emergency room at Grace Cottage, you're going to be in a treatment room probably within 10 minutes of your arrival. Uh, and the majority of those patients spend less than two and a half hours here. Uh, start to finish uh, on average, uh, which is dramatically different than emergency rooms and other full service community hospitals uh, around the state of Vermont. So I think that that has a, a big, uh, I believe has a significant role in why we, we see, you know, we're seeing more people come to the emergency room. I agree with Stephen, second homeowners are either more people here in Southern Vermont than ever before. That's a function of the pandemic. And I think that's probably not going to change anytime soon. Um, and so, um, and then there, there are other people who don't have uh, primary care providers that, that are not established with, with primary care providers. And, uh, and they use the emergency room as their doctor's office, uh, which is unfortunate. But what we do in that case is when we have a patient in the ED who does not have an established uh, care provider in the area, uh, we um, ask them if they would like to have their care established with one of our uh, family medicine or APPs in the rural health clinic, and we facilitate a follow-up appointment in the clinic for that patient, particularly those where the ED provider has uh, determined that a follow-up appointment is necessary. We make every effort to schedule that follow-up appointment in our clinic before the patient leaves the ED. Uh, and so, you know, to, again, to, to try and uh, jumpstart that relationship so that ultimately, uh, we establish them in the clinic so they don't need to use the ED in the future. So we, we work very diligently at that. Mm -hmm. I think another, speaking of the pandemic, another possibility could be as well that, um, as we all know, especially in the first year, year and a half of it, a lot of people were putting off health care. Not, they're not being able to get preventative care because of all the times the hospitals were closed, but a lot of people were just scared to death to go anywhere near a healthcare facility or even a primary care practice and just were not getting their work done. So I th there's probably a number of people as well that now all of a sudden have urgent conditions that might in the past have been prevented and are still don't even want to go into a primary care practice. So they, even though they could get an appointment, they don't schedule and then all of a sudden they need to go when they end up in the emergency department. George, your hand was up earlier. Yeah, I don't think I'm sworn in. I was advised. 
<laughs> I am. I am the EDA. So, so, so I'll, I'll speak for I'll speak for George. Uh, he, uh, he he wanted he wanted to remind me that you know we uh, we've we've seen quite a number of patients uh, coming here from from the Springfield area. You know, Springfield, you know, had some some operating operational difficulties uh, in the last couple of years and are still working their way through some of those challenges. Um, uh, they had uh, some some pretty substantial upheaval in their emergency department. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, some of their providers have ended up here as a result of that. And so uh, they've attracted some Springfield patients to our emergency room. Um, and, and as George points out, you know, um, there are sicker people in, in the region. People are getting older. Uh, you know, Vermont is not known for attracting young, young, healthy people. Uh, we're an aging state where southern vermont's an aging region and uh as people get older they they just have more health care needs and i think that also plays into the ed as well yeah i think th those all make sense i think um there's also and i know i understand or hear um the the small volume that you're talking about if it's like nine people a day um but i'd also recommend just thinking about trying to understand this increase through your equity lens some of these patients um, may be underinsured or uninsured, and so they're foregoing care, not because of the pandemic, but because they're afraid of the cost, and then they become very sick or have an accident and need to go. Um, and, and so, and those patients, those individuals, underinsured and uninsured, they're um, they're frequently from historically marginalized groups, women or single family, um, single parent families, uh, low income individuals. And so there's an opportunity through that equity work that your organization has done to try to understand the needs of the people that are behind the increase use of the emergency department and make sure that um, there, the resources that are necessary are being driven in that direction, just like the equity work elsewhere. I see you um, nodding your head, George. So I'll I'll stop there and um, pass it back to Chair Holmes. Thanks for that recommendation, Tom. We appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you. Um, some of my fellow board members touched on some of my questions. I might dig a little bit deeper in some areas, but um, I appreciated their questions already and your answers already. Uh, one of my questions is regarding the 5% the change in charge. Um, in the narrative, you talked about fiscal year 22 and how the approved fiscal year 22 rate increase was 5% as well, but that 5% was only recognized on a very small percentage of the commercial payer charges that are reimbursed on a percentage of charge basis. And then it goes on to say that the majority of commercial payer services are reimbursed on a fee schedule that is generally updated on an annual basis in almost no instances, if any, were any of those increases close to the 5%. So I appreciated that insight. And I guess my question was twofold then. So looking at back at fiscal year 22, the year that we're in, yep. what would you say the actual effective commercial rate increase you experienced in, in this year is? In other words, for the commercial, the average commercial patient, you know, between 21 and 22, what is the effective commercial rate increase that they experienced? And then how do we think about the 5% that you're asking for uh, 23? What would what would that actually translate into in terms of an, an effective commercial rate? Not quite sure how you'd calculate that. Just pulling a number out of my head. Um, well, you can also, you know what? I mean, I'm asking all hospitals to do this. So I would say to you, you don't have to pull it out of your hat. You can follow up with Sarah with, uh, you know. Okay. Yeah, I mean, can, we can try and look at them. So, but I mean, yes, you, I mean, I'm, you, you completely understand what I was trying to say. Yes. Um, so, you know, you'd have to look at the, um, you know, kind of get an idea of by insurance company, you know, look at the ones, you know, Blue Cross is a good example. The majority of what they pay us on an outpatient basis for all of lab and x-ray are all fee schedules. So, you know, what did they increase their fee schedule? Was it 2% or 3% or whatever? You know, there's a very small volume of our business where they pay percent of charges, 
for say some of the emergency department work and things like that, but it's two different percent of charges depending on which type of a Blue Cross plan it is, managed care or not. Um, so yes, we can try and I'll talk to Sarah and see if we can come up with a number that makes sense. I think that would be really helpful because at the end of the day, we're trying to understand what is the real impact, right, to the commercial patient in your community. And so recognizing there's not a one for one correlation at all, you know, between right. change in charge and what people truly experience. We're trying to unpack that a little bit and understand what the, you know, what the impact is. So, it, yeah, truthfully, you're right. I mean, truthfully, whether we increase our rates 5% or 25%, there's really no impact to the commercial payers for the majority of the work. So there's no change for the, all of the work that's done on a fee schedule. There is no change. You know, right. they have, you know, um, for the ones that are on a percent of charges, yes, if they were, they're either going to meet their deductible quicker or they're going to, um, you know, if they haven't met the deductible, still no impact because they're, it's, um really no impact even if they're where they're paying 20 percent you're right they're paying 20 percent of a higher number so it's still a pretty minimal impact um but yeah we'll try and come up with something that would be super helpful and i think as we go forward you know in in the hospital budget process i think you know we're going to try and at least my my hope is that we'll try and ask hospitals that calculation in advance so that we can really better understand Yes, we want to know what change in charges, but I think we also want to understand the effective uh, rate. So if there's a way you know, and, and as you're a right, board, we don't discuss that, but I think that would be helpful for us to understand. On that note, I mean, along with that kind of going back to one of Doug's major discussions on risk, um, you know, what we increase our rates or what we charge isn't even relevant, for instance, on Medicaid, which is a significant portion, as Tom pointed out, of our patient revenue because everything they pay is paid on a fee schedule, which is not adequate. I mean, I just was looking at our 990, which we filed last week, and the Medicaid shortfall for this little tiny facility is two and a half million dollars. It's 9% of our expense budget is what Medicaid is not paying this organization to even cover costs, not not below what we charge, but what they're paying below the actual cost to provide those services. So, you know, and truthfully, I know you don't necessarily have control over this because you don't set Medicaid's rates, um, but hospitals should not be expected to be financing the state of Vermont Medicaid program. You know, if they're going to have a Medicaid program and expand a program, which is great, you know, we shouldn't be contributing two and a half million dollars to that program. I mean, and if that's what Grace Cottage is contributing, I can't imagine what the other hospitals in the state of Vermont are contributing toward what the state should be figuring out how it should be paying. You know, I mean, and you're right that that affects the commercial insurers. You know, I mean, the reason we're having to charge those rates in hopes that med the commercial insurers will pay a little tiny bit is the fact that Medicaid's not. But anyway, uh, get off yeah, my soapbox so here. <laughs> it's a topic that's come up uh, every year, and uh -huh. the board has, in in various ways, um, made reference to you know the fact that Medicaid should be keeping pace with inflation. It was part of our, for example, long-term sustainability report to the legislature as one of the recommendations that we've made is keeping pace with inflation on right. Medicaid reimbursement rates. But as you just said, we don't set Medicaid rates. Right. So but that yeah. is something the state needs to understand. You know, they're they're sitting there expecting you to keep hospital budgets in line and they're expecting you to keep commercial insurance rates in line. Yet they're the biggest contributor to the problem. Well, let me let me probe a little bit around that. So, you you know, you have talked about um, low reimbursements from Medicaid and from Medicare, in fact, um, and an inability to cover costs and. I think that many hospitals will echo that sentiment. And I wonder mm -hmm. if Grace, um, you know, with frankly, you know, your average daily census of 10 
an ED mm -hmm. volume of nine, and yet you're keeping your ED open all the time. Um, I, I just want to ask you, you know, given today's inflationary pressures, the workforce pressures, the high costs of technological innovation, and your low, low volumes, um, and the expectation that you're going to keep an ED open all the time and the fixed costs of running that, you're not benefiting from economies of scale. And no. You know, how are you know, in, as we start to think about this, how, what is the plan to, to, to be able to do that, given the payers reimbursement rates and those fixed costs that you are facing? Um, you know, it's a good question, but also it's a little bit of an unfair question, um, you know, because we're not we're not talking about, you know, the fact that we closed the nursing home uh, in our history. We're not talking about the fact that we closed the maternity uh, and OBGYN program in our history. Um, Grace Cottage is here to serve the needs of our community and those that rely and depend on us. And uh, we're going to provide the services that we can provide as long as we can provide them uh, yeah. while keeping our doors open um, and paying our bills and recruiting good staff and paying competitive wages. Um, and if it comes to the point where we feel as though we cannot su succeed or survive because of the weight of an emergency room or because of the weight of a small uh, acute care and swing bed program here at Grace Cottage, then we'll have to have those tough discussions about whether or not we change again. Um, our our uh, our biggest uh, revenue you know uh, uh, generator and and uh, I think it's our biggest revenue generator. It's our rural health clinic. Maybe not. Yes, Stephen's nodding. Yes, thank <laughs> you. Uh, I'm glad I get correctly. Um, uh, that's our that's our major. Um, uh, service line and something that is probably more important to our community than anything else we do. Uh, we're going to continue to to do that, but uh, to the extent that um, that we can we can uh, weather the challenges uh, and provide as much care locally and close to home for our patients, that's what we're going to do. Because uh, failure to do that means people that need emergency care are going to have to drive a half an hour to get it. And people will die uh, in, in that period of time. Uh, it's, that's, the, that's the reality. Um, we have people coming from all over the state of Vermont for, for post-acute rehabilitation because Grace Cottage is as good at providing that service as almost any organization we believe in the mm -hmm. state. So, uh, again, it's really about meeting the needs of our patients and doing it in a way uh, – that, that you know, uh, shows them we care and that we're not going anywhere. And the reason they support us, every time they send us a check, it's because they want to make sure that Grace Cottage doesn't go anywhere, that Grace right. Cottage stays open. Uh, that's a loud message for a small hospital to generate $2 million a year in donations. Um, yeah. It speaks loudly about what our community is asking of us. And we are owned by the community. Yeah. Well, you know, I you know I appreciate that passion for your community and the caring. I, I I just worry about the numbers as I'm looking at it. So understand, I appreciate the care and the passion and the desire to to provide for your community. And your I think voice. all the hospitals in Vermont this year are worrying about the numbers. We worry about them every day. You know, <laughs> and on that note, just to a little further, as Doug said, you know, if our emergency department wasn't here, it's not just patients would be driving a half an hour to get care. Some of them have already driven half an hour or 45 minutes to get here, and it would be an additional half an hour. Um, it's the it's you know people look and say, well, you're only 17 miles north of Brattleboro. This is true, but it takes a half an hour to get there on a good day. Um, trust me, I did it many times driving in an ambulance. I did that for years here. Um, but quite often, it's the people that live north and west of us that the next closest hospital once you're north and west of us is. Rutland, which is an hour and 15 minutes away, or Bennington over to the west, which is an hour plus away. I mean, there's, it's, if you look at us on a map, it's not just that we're 17 miles north of Brattleboro. We're the only thing in this huge area. So, right. but I, we all hear you. Yes, we look at the numbers every day and it's like, how, you know, how can you do this? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, the other, you know, the worry that I have too is, the budget projects a you know negative 3.7 percent operating margin and near zero total margin and i have always appreciated the um devotion frankly of your community and supporting you through donations and and all of that and i just worry 
a bit about, you know, fears of recession, right, that, that folks are talking about and investment losses that we're seeing to the degree that your community that is so dedicated and so passionate is going to be able to continue to help you meet that dot bottom line. So, so these are the things that I'm thinking about, and I just wanted to articulate them to you as I look at, you know, your day's cash on hand falling from 123, projected at least as far as I can see, down to 109 in the moment when you're, when you're making this uh, – thinking about making some big capital investments in a new medical building. And so, you know, as I'm looking at these numbers and I appreciate clearly every year, the passion that you have for your community, just thinking about how that's all gonna roll out given the, the, the headwinds that we face. Let me just see if I have any other questions on here. Um, Actually, just one other one. The the delay in ED patient transfers that you mentioned due to the delivery system stress, um, I can appreciate that, and we've heard that as well from you know the bottlenecks in the system. We have been hearing about, and I've been reading about, in all the narratives, and and I'm hoping that we can, through our long run sustainability planning efforts, start to think about that. Um, and I'm wondering though, in the short run, with uh, the new bed tower going in at Dartmouth Hitchcock, you know, with construction completed apparently this fall and opening up in 2023, do you think that will help you given your proximity, closer proximity to Dartmouth Hitchcock and some other hospitals in the state? Um, will that relieve some of the stress that you're facing in terms of the delay in, in patient transfers? I think it will. I think it will also, <clears throat> also help uh, Grace Cottage <clears throat> um, as it relates to referral uh, for, for you know, swing bed patients and um, helping Dartmouth, you know, keep the lower acuity folks moving through. Uh, you know, we're here with open arms and we have a very close working relationship with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, and they know that, uh, that we're, we're, we're able to, to uh, accommodate a fair number of their uh, post-acute uh, patients who are, you know, who are tying up beds. So uh, I, think, uh, I think it will, will uh, help us more than hurt us. Okay, great. Um, I, I'm going to pass it over to our staff if there are any staff questions. Um, Sarah Lindbergh, pass it off to you. Good morning, Sarah Lindbergh, head of the uh, hospital finance team here with the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, I just had one question this morning, and that is uh, the final rule for the inpatient perspective payment system ended up being a little bit higher than the uh, proposed rule. Uh, it was effectively going to be kind of a cut, but now it's a modest increase. I also know that Grace Cottage tends to have uh, not average <laughs> service mix compared to a typical Medicare primary hospital. So I was just wondering, um, in your estimation, if that would uh, change materially the revenue you were projecting uh, for 23 in your budget? No, because we are not a PPS hospital. It doesn't affect the critical access hospital reimbursements. Yep. I. <laughs> the cost will eventually hit the cost reporting, right. I know, down the line. Yeah. But yeah, so just want it on the record. Thank yep. you very much. <laughs> That's it for staff. Okay, great. Circling back, are there any board members that have any follow-up questions? No. All right. Um, why don't I, I'm, I'm just trying to see, we're actually ahead of schedule. Why don't I just allow folks, we'll take a brief, if there's no objections, just a 10 minute recess before I kick it over to the HCA so that folks can grab a drink, stretch and possibly bio break if needed. Um, and so we'll come back at 1020 and then we'll hear from the HCA. And thank you, Grace, if you can just hang on. <laughs> we, we're almost there. Wonderful, take it away, Sam. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Sam Peich, Health Policy Analyst with the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, or the HCA. Just a couple of questions from our office this morning. I want to start off by highlighting, Grace Cottage, the work that you've done. You're a real leader in updating your PFA bill, or updating to come into compliance with the PFA bill that was passed in the legislature, changing your eligibility guidelines, changing the different ways that you reach out to people through phone calls to get people on PFA if they could be eligible. So um, want to appreciate and commend you for that work. 
and also recognize, and Member Walsh pointed this out too, but also from our office, recognize the work you've done with the Human Rights Commission and the health equity focus requirements you've implemented. I think you're a real leader in that area as well. Our, our first question, on page 10 of your narrative, you talked about not participating in the ACO model because of a lack of potential financial benefit. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on how this decision was reached and what, if anything, could be done to incentivize your participation in any of the programs. I'll leave that for Doug. Um, you know, uh, in order for us to, to consider um, oh, you know, okay. uh, joining, uh, you know, the ACO and taking on the the risk and, and expense involved in meeting the participation requirements, uh, there's a lot of work involved in being um, a participant in, in the ACO. It takes a lot of staff time. Uh, we're a very small organization. We don't have uh, a great depth in terms of financial analysts and staff members to do that kind of work. So we looked at what the requirements would be in order to meet the participation uh, objectives and uh, looked at what the cost would be for us to participate in that endeavor uh, mm -hmm. in terms of labor and, and otherwise. Um, and we, we just, it just doesn't make uh, a, a fiscal sense for us to do that uh, given the fact that we're, we're not a full service hospital, we don't have the the the, the ability to impact um, you know, healthcare costs across the state as the the larger uh, full service hospitals do. Um, it just doesn't, you know, for a variety of reasons, doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to jump in now. Also, given the fact that there's such uncertainty about, you know, what the future, um, you know, payer reimbursement models might look like and, you know, the direction that Vermont um, might go in uh, in terms of looking at other opportunities and other models, um, whether it be global budgets or what have you, um, there's still just a lot of uncertainty out there. Um, we want to participate. Obviously, we care greatly about lowering costs for care in the state of Vermont, and we want to participate every opportunity we can to uh, to contribute to that endeavor and plan to to stand by our colleagues and do that when the right opportunity presents. We just don't believe that jumping into the ACO at this late hour, given the uncertainties that certainly are ahead of us in the next year or two, make a whole lot of sense to us. Uh, we continue to maintain our, our conversations with the leaders at the ACO. We have a good relationship with them. Um, you know, we're collaborative and we've exp explained our, our thinking and they certainly understand where we're coming from. There's no hard feelings. Um, we just uh, we just want to make sure that we make good, sound fiscal decisions and make sure that we're positioned to help uh, lower costs for care in the state of Vermont every opportunity we can. So. Thank you. Appreciate it. And just following up a bit on the CARES Act and Medicare advance monies that you returned, I heard in your narrative and when you're testifying today, a lot of the increased costs do seem to be pandemic related. So I'm wondering what went into the decision to return those monies and why they couldn't have been used to offset some of those costs, or if it was a matter of integrity um, and the specific intention of the funds misaligning with the strings attached from the federal monies. It was the fact that the money that we had received had to be used by a certain period of time by okay. June 30th of last fiscal year. So we did indeed, that's what we used the money for was revenue shortfalls during the beginning through the June 30th of last year, as well as some capital projects and expense increases. But it, we couldn't, it's the expenses for this fiscal year, for instance, wouldn't have been eligible under those funds. Okay. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Okay, great. I think at this point, then we will open it up for any public comment. If anybody has any comment they'd like to make, if you could use the raise your hand function on Teams, I will see you. Or if you are on the phone and you'd like to ask, make a comment, you can uh, sing, you can speak now. OK. 
Okay, I am not seeing any hands raised or hearing any questions from the public. Okay, um, well, thank you to all the Grace Cottage team. I know how much work goes into preparing these budgets and for frankly taking care of all of your uh, patients in your community. And there's a lot of gratitude from I think all of us on the board for all the work that you're doing um, to make sure that care is delivered to your communities. Um, and appreciate all the efforts you made in submitting this budget and allowing us to review the materials. Thank you, Jessica. We appreciate Thank it. You. If you have any other questions, you know, just shout. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much. I do appreciate it. Have a great day. You too. Have a great day. I think what we'll do is I'm going to keep on our schedule. Uh, we are going to have a, an early lunch, I suppose, is what I would call this, because I don't think the Springfield team is prepared to start before noon. So I'm going to keep you know, our commitment to starting on the schedule for them in case they have other commitments during the day. So we will be back here at noon uh, to hear from the Springfield team. So I'm just going to put us in recess until that point. And so eat lunch, take a walk, do that, and we'll all be back here at noon to hear from Springfield.